so it, it's always a pleasure and honor to, uh, to come here and, uh, and talk with this audience, both the audience here in Florida as well as the people watching um, around the world. And, um, and again, I, I think I told someone else a story, but uh, I think a, a year or two ago after I gave this talk, I did get an email from someone in uh, Tasmania who actually had uh, watched the uh, presentation and had uh, emailed me a question. So there are people uh, quite far away watching this. Um, so I uh, wanted to talk about uh, some work that we're doing and also some work actually more broadly in terms of how we're increasingly thinking about treating cancer from the perspective of understanding its underlying biology and how to use that to develop a more effective uh, what I call rational cancer therapies. So just, uh, just want to point out some disclosures. We do get research funding from some companies, and I've uh, done some uh, consulting, including to the uh, company Lilly, who is uh, sponsoring this uh, um, uh, event. So in terms of the big picture, what I like to think about is uh, how we're trying to change how we really vision uh, developing cancer therapy. And here, what I'm thinking more about is the more uh, <laughs> systemic um, and uh, use of um, chemotherapy as opposed to the more local approaches such as surgery and radiation. And when we think about how we've tried to develop systemic uh, cancer therapy, cancer that goes all throughout the whole body, for many, many years, what we've been essentially trying to do is um, uh, mix and match different chemotherapy drugs, which are essentially sort of uh, poisonous uh, compounds, to try to find some combination by really trial and error that works a little bit better than the other alternatives. Um, I think that's still going on, and clearly that approach has helped many patients. It's even led to significant cures and diseases like uh, pediatric leukemia and uh, so forth. But that approach, while with those shouldn't be entirely abandoned, needs to be supplanted and supplemented by a newer approach, which really is to ask the question of actually what drives each cancer? What are the processes in that cell that makes that cancer cell act the way it does? And how we could use that information to more rationally and effectively attack what is making that cancer cancer? And also, as part of this way of using biology to treat cancer, is also thinking about how we could unleash the immune system also to, de to develop better cancer therapies. And a lot of what I think about, and a lot of people in the cancer biology world, is thinking about the genome, the DNA of cancer. And every cell in our bodies, from you know the tip of your toes to the uh, top of your head, uh, has DNA in it. And so that DNA is a s string of chromosomes, and together you have essentially three billion letters, A, C, Gs, and Ts, which together form the instructions for making all the proteins that do the work of your cell. And so we have three billion letters, you know, across 23 different chromosomes, and those letters spell the recipe for making proteins. And the proteins in our cell do all sorts of things. You know, some of them um, make cells want to grow and divide. Some of them make cells want to slow down and not grow. Just like, by analogy, you have a car, and there are pieces of the car whose job is to make it go. There you have the gas pedal, you have you know, the, the line going from the gas pedal to the engine. You have things that make the car go faster. You also have things that make the car go slower. You have the brakes, you have the brake lines, you have the brake pads. You have all these different pieces. And a cell is just like that. There's different mechanisms to make something go. There's different, me different mechanisms to make something stop. And one simple way to view a cancer cell is that some of the, the genes for the proteins that make something go are turned on, and some of the genes for the proteins that make something stop are turned off. So if you had a car where the brake line was cut and the gas pedal was caught on the floor, you'd imagine that car would be moving pretty fast. 
And just the same way, if you imagine a cell where the mechanisms that make a cell grow and divide were turned on, and the mechanisms that make the cell slow down were turned off, that that combination would make that cell grow and divide many more times than it should. And in some ways, that's really what cancer is. And now if we think about the way we can understand the DNA as a way to understand what makes cancers tick, um, it's important to think about what kind of DNA change, changes we're talking about. And this gets to a point that came up in the, the, the panel earlier, um, which is about the kind of genes that you inherit versus the kind of genes that are abnormal in the cancer. And the sort of the fancier words for this are somatic and germline. So somatic alterations, and somatic comes from a word meaning of the body. Um, these are the <clears throat> acquired changes or mutation in the DNA, and this is what was not inherited. So these are not the genes you got from your mom and your dad, but these are the way that the cancer cells' genes are different than the uh, DNA in the other cells of the body. Now, the vast majority of what people talk about when they're talking about cancer genomes and cancer genomes guiding therapy is this. So most of the targeted therapies we have in cancer really are about these kinds of changes, really about the way that the cancer cell is different than the rest of the body. Um, and because these are ways that the cancer cells are different, these particular gene changes are not passed on to your children. So just like the question earlier, if your tumor is HER2 positive, that HER2 gene is not passed down to the children. And just like a, a lung cancer with an EGFR mutation, it's not passed down to your children, and so forth. By contrast, the term germline refers to the things in your genome that you inherited from your parents, and then for you are going to be able to pass on to children. So these are present in all of the cells of the body, not just the cancer cells. And one example here would be uh, the gene BRCA1, which is, you know, probably the most famous cancer genes, thanks to, you know, Angelina <coughs> Jolie and so forth. And so that's a situation where you have a gene that puts you at risk of cancer, and that is something that is passed down. So there are situations like this in GI cancer, such as the CDH1 mutation in hereditary <coughs> diffuse gastric cancer, but the vast majority of GI cancers, including gastric cancers, are not, we think, caused by these um, strong hereditary syndromes. So really what I'm going to be talking about in here is the somatic side, the ways that the DNA of the cancer is different than the DNA of the body, or the rest of the body. And so there's different ways that your cancer DNA can be altered in a way that could influence the genes that cause or, um, or make cancers grow. So you can have what's called a, a mutation, and this is really, I think of as a typographical error. So you have a bunch of letters that spell the recipe for a given protein, like a protein to make the cell stop, a protein to make the cell go, and in some case, one tiny little error, just changing one letter in the recipe for that protein can have a huge consequence. And so there are genes such as the ones I list here are called, such as KRAS and BRAF, where one little change in that letter can have a huge um, impact. And this can impact therapy. The classic example is there are mutations that turn on a gene called EGFR in lung cancer, and patients who have those mutations are highly sensitive to an inhibitor whose job is to block that, the, uh, the protein EGFR. What's more common in esophageal and gastric cancer in terms of the ones, the gene changes that are clinically relevant, I think, are what are called amplifications and <laughs> deletions. And so normally, for each of the genes we have, you get one copy from your mom, one copy from your dad. So you have two copies of every gene. Um, sometimes what happens in cancer is that a whole portion of the genome, not just a, a, a one letter, but a, a bigger chunk, gets lost or gets gained. And so sometimes, you, instead of having two copies of a gene that slows growth, you, get, you lose one or then you lose two, and that, that break is no longer there. And also, sometimes the area of the genome that has a, a gene that makes cells grow 
uh, faster gets amplified, gets copied many times. So you could have, you know, dozens, even hundreds of copies of a pro-growth gene. And so if you imagine a car that has, you know, 80 <laughs> gas pedals, that car might be driving a bit faster than one that has one gas pedal. And this can be clinically relevant. So, for example, we already use testing for this gene called ERB2 or HER2, where if that gene is overexpressed or amplified in gastric esophageal cancer, we know that on average, adding a, an inhibitor to that HER2 protein called trastuzumab can, can help um, patients. Um, there are also some other alterations where you take two genes and link them together to make an aberrant fusion gene. There are examples of how these are clinically relevant. These are not, to date, very common in esophageal and gastric cancer, uh, nor do they guide therapy right now. So you know, why um, is studying the genome, I think, uh, going to help guide how we take care of patients? So uh, I think the important idea is that the genes that are responsible for making a cancer cancer, the gene that gets turned on to make that cancer grow is something that not only causes cancer, but then becomes something that cancer still needs. So if a car is driving fast because the gas pedal is stuck to the floor, if you could unstick the pedal, the car will slow down. Just the same way we think if a car, if a cell is dividing and dividing because a certain gene is turned on, blocking that, that, that gene can have effects and be more effective. But and exactly this is the point here, is that the, um, a lot of the drugs being developed by biotech and pharma are trying to block the different proteins in the cell that can be turned on. But the, the caveat is, is that two people can walk into clinic and have, quote unquote, the same cancer, but it doesn't mean that the genes that are active, that are broken in the cancer, will be the same. And if you think that patients have different genes that are pushing cancers, and the genes can tell you about the optimal drugs. Therefore, two people who come in who have both have colon cancer, both have breast cancer, both have gastric cancer, aren't necessarily going to be optimally treated by the exact same drug. And if we think about how we've been developing cancer therapy for many, many years, we've been trying to ask the question, what's the best you know, drug combination for metastatic breast cancer? What's the best drug combination for metastatic gastric cancer? And implicit in that is the idea that these people are the same. But increasingly now, when we come time to thinking about the newer generation of therapies, we're realizing the patients are actually different. And if you try to um, apply the same um, uh, therapy to everybody, it's not going to be effective. So for example, you might have one car that's driving fast because the gas pedal is stuck to the floor. One car that's driving fast because someone's foot is pushing down the gas pedal. So if you have a, a car that was driving fast because the gas pedal is stuck to the floor and you just remove your foot from it, the car is going to keep going. It's the same way. So if you have, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're trying to block the wrong thing that's making something grow fast, um, it's, it's not going to work in that population, in those patients. And so the big idea is that profiling the genome can help us find what's driving each cancer and therefore select optimal therapies for each patient. Um, this is the, the ultimate goal that we're trying to build towards. And so I think a, um, a simple way of thinking about this is that we, we've sort of largely tried to pursue one size fits all approaches developing cancer therapies, but increasingly, you know, we're thinking what's the best way to treat these patients but as we could look into the DNA and the genome, increasingly what we're going to try to do is really understand that you're trying to think of the optimal way to take care of those groups of those people, but you actually had quite <clears throat> different populations of there who in the apples and the oranges might not, you know, optimally be treated with the exact same um, kind of therapy. So now when I'm talking about therapy here, things can get a little bit confusing because we talk a lot about we're going to study the genes and we're going to give drugs. So people say, well, okay, that may, must mean gene therapy. But this, this, we're not trying to drug the genes here. So what genes are, genes are the recipes to make the proteins. Proteins do things in your cell. And so if you have a, a mutant protein that makes, an, sorry, a mutant gene makes an abnormal protein. An amplified gene makes too much protein. So overwhelmingly, drugs block proteins. So the drugs, 
So targeted therapies block specific proteins in your cell. So we're not treating the genes, rather the gene information tells us which protein to try to target. So when we do a gene test to guide therapy, we're not trying to guide gene therapy, we're trying to identify what proteins to try to block in the cell. And we've made a lot of progress in understanding the, the genome in gastric cancer. There's been incredible new technologies for studying DNA, normal DNA, cancer DNA, and has allowed us to do things which would have seemed really unimaginable, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And so this is just a little uh, cartoon from a project uh, that I was uh, fortunate to be able to, to, to co-lead called the Cancer Genome Atlas, where we tried to map out very carefully the different ways that the genome is altered across different gastric cancers. And what's relevant here is that we found different classes of gastric cancers with different patterns of alterations, again pointing out how this is not a homogeneous <laughs> disease, but there were different classes of tumors that tend to have different features. And so even thinking back to some of the prior conversations we've had in this room, where we've been arguing about, you know, is chemo radiation better or should we just have chemotherapy, should we have chemotherapy and radiation? Again, that is still, you know, uh, largely <coughs> collapsing everything to the average, where in reality, we might learn over time that there are certain groups that have the biology where maybe for these tumors, radiation is more important, although maybe these tumors, chemotherapy is more important. You know, and again, as we try to continue to take heterogeneous things and try to lump them together, we're gonna sort of be a little bit um, uh, 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 reduced in our ability to find the optimal answers. And now there's other ways to try to think about uh, how to categorize these cancers. This is, you know, another paper that came out around the same time, which also developed a the classification approach based on the genome. So there's different ways to try to divide these cancers into groups to help us guide therapy. Now here I just show a little bit of data from our paper, and this is what uh, just shows it's a little bit too detailed maybe, but it shows how we found different groups of of gastric cancers, and then we looked within those groups, what were the genes that were often turned on somehow. So the, the big red areas are where you have a gene that's amplified, many extra copies, and those smaller green boxes are where you have a mutations. So what you see is, for example, there's a group of tumors on the right where there's a lot of red boxes. There's some tumors that like to have lots and lots of gene amplifications. There's some, like the second to the left, the tumors that are called MSI or microsatellite unstable, those have lots and lots of mutations. They tend to have lots of those little green boxes, but not the red. And so, but there are a lot of different tumors that have different genes that are turned on. And in many cases, the genes that are being turned on in these tumors are the same genes that make proteins that our colleagues in industry are developing in, in inhibitors for. So it gives us a new ability to try to sort of match the gene and the inhibitor to develop more rational approaches for therapy. So what does this mean? So we're increasingly having new ideas about the genes that are altered, that are turned on in many uh, different uh, cancers, including gastric cancer. And this idea gives us information about candidate therapeutic targets that may be useful for individual patients. However, these data are not in any way a guarantee that a particular drug will help a given patient. But they could help us think about, you know, for example, what clinical trials one may want to uh, consider based on the, the uh, DNA in their tumor. Um, now, I admit when I got into this field of trying to study the cancer genome, I was somewhat probably too optimistic in how easy this would be. And the simple idea was that you would profile the genome from patients. You say, oh, Mrs. Jones' tumor has a gene X mutation. Mrs. Smith's tumor has a gene Y. And Mr. Jackson has a gene Z mutation. So treating them is easy. You just give them anti-X, anti-Y, or anti-Z, and then you'll <coughs> cure them and <coughs> go home. The reality is it's definitely not that easy. So genome-guided therapy is not a simple panacea. It's not a simple <coughs> cure-all. Why is that? Well, cancers are smart, and good targeted therapies, when they work, are generally only, tar any, only uh, helpful for a temporary amount of time. And the reason is, is tumors become what we call resistant. 
sometimes that resistance can happen very, very quickly. Sometimes it happens after several months or even several years. And so as we think about how we're going to use this data to guide therapy, what we have to learn is really how tumors become resistant. And so how can we not only have the right drug for the right patient, but how do we be ready for what comes next? And really, this is going to require doing the work in the laboratory to figure out how to develop optimal approaches to, um, to, have these, to, uh, to attack these genes that are turned on in these cancers. And so this is like one um, analogy or a quote from Wayne Gretzky is a good hockey player plays where the puck is. You know, I think a great hockey player plays where the puck is going to be. And if I think where, I think the puck is now, I think the puck is now saying, what are the genes and what are the drugs we could use to try to target the gene in the patient? And the long-term question is really, we know that that is a temporizing measure, but what comes next? How do we develop the rational combinations to deal with the resistance and so forth? Um, so really, sort of how do we build from this idea now we could use the genome, find the right drug from the right patient, and then go from there. Um, so essentially, if we can learn cancer's escape routes, how they're going to try to work around the, the, the rational therapies we put in their way, we could try to figure out how to block their escape routes. You know, so if you know that if you put a roadblock on First Avenue, that all the cars are going to go down Second Avenue, you could be, you know, you, you, you could be ready. If you really want to stop traffic, you know, you have to block First Avenue and Second Avenue is a simple analogy, and which I think of as really idea of actually switching to playing a game of chess with cancer. You make a move against cancer and think about what cancer is going to do next and then how they're going to try to deal with what you've put in their way. And that's how you develop, I think, long-term uh, good uh, 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 combination therapies. So you know, how do we do this? Really, to do this, you have to see what happens in a cancer. If a cancer has gene X turned on and you give it anti-X, what does that cancer do? You know, there's a lot of things that we can't do in our patients, nor should we do in our patients. We have to do them in the laboratory to figure out what therapies to bring to our patients. So we need to bring this into the lab. That means we need to actually have cancers that we could test in the lab. So we have to, you know, be able to grow cancer cells so we could test therapies to understand the rules of how they're going to try to work around what we do to them. And we need lots of different models of cancers. You know, we don't do... Um, a clinical trial in one patient and say, oh, we, we, we gave this a therapy to Mrs. Jones and it works, so now we're going to treat every patient with gastric cancer with this therapy. We do our trials in lots of patients and we should do our research in lots of models to understand uh, how all this should and could happen. And we need to know what's going on in the genome of our models, what genes are turned on. So this is an example of some work that we and other people are doing now is increasingly as patients get their cancer sample, they get a biopsy, they get surgery, uh, we're then trying to grow those tumors in the lab. In some cases, we actually implant them into mice. And so you could have mice growing tumors that were, came from a patient. Um, in some cases, you grow them in plastic dishes. But then in those settings, you could then test different drugs. And then you could give the drug to the, the, the mouse with the tumor. And then one day later, you harvest the tumor and say, OK, what's changed? Or you, know, you could do the things that you can't do in patients. You can try to understand how we're going to develop better, more effective combinations, and then do the work that then helps you know what trials to then try in patients. Because there's not enough time, there's not enough patience to figure this out in people. You have to figure it out in models and take the results into patients. So a lot of people ask me, what should I do? Um, should I get my tumor profiled? Um, it's definitely possible. Uh, even from small samples, people who only have a little biopsy, it's increasingly feasible and technically possible to do it. Um, it's generally not standard of care. And the reason it's not standard of care, because if we knew what to do with the data and we knew the data would definitely help people, it would be standard of care. But it's not, so we're still learning. But having, having genomic data may give you ideas about possible approaches, possible clinical trials to <laughs> consider. But I have a lot of caveats in this because I think there's no far from any guarantee that patients will benefit right now from having this testing done. 
I think increasingly it's going to become done more routinely, but right now we don't know enough about how to interpret the data and, and, what, and what to do once we find the genes that are altered. So people who want to get this done, there are several ways to go about doing it. So a number of big academic centers do this already in a routine or semi-routine fashion. Um, so we have an effort called <coughs> Profile at Dana-Farber that is doing this. Other big centers are doing something similar. Um, there are a lot of companies that are en entering into this space. Of course, they're doing it um, as a company to, to get um, paid. So still there's not a lot of sense how the testing quality is company to company. And it's also inconsistency about insurance companies paying for it, but there's a lot that's out there already. Um, interpretation is still a challenge. You know, many tests only look at the tumor, so sometimes you don't know if a change is a somatic or a germline uh, test. And again, even if you find the, um, the, the change that gives you an idea about the, 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 the therapy to consider, we often don't know that that therapy clearly will work in a gastric patient with this mutation. So, you know, this still, this is a very much an evolving field. Um, but again, these could be quite helpful, especially if we're thinking about which cl clinical trial to consider if you're thinking about going on a trial of drug X, drug, drug Y, or drug Z, and if you know that your tumor has a drug, has a mutation of gene X, it's more rational to go in the trial of, of to in inhibit X rather than inhibit Y or Z, you know. But again, we don't know for sure that that will work because if we knew it would work, it wouldn't be research. It'll be something we'd already be doing for everybody. So, in summary, for this part of the talk, so so cancer, the cancer genome and targeted therapy. So, broden, uh, uh, mutant or broken genes are one of the key causes of cancer. And mutant genes can often tell us what are good candidate targets to consider for therapy. And we're increasingly implementing genomic profiling in the clinic to use these to guide therapy, either standard therapy or increasingly to guide <coughs> clinical trials. And it's a very exciting field, and there's a lot that has to be done to be able to, to, to make this really work. So again, so this is really work that's in progress, and uh, it's very exciting, and I think in the, if we imagine how we're treating cancer 10, 20 years from now, you know, I'm fairly confident that this will be routine, but there's a lot to learn between now and then to really make this right and make it so this data really effectively helps patients as much as possible. Um, and I, the briefly, I just wanted to, in terms of the cancer biology, I also wanted to touch on, how am I doing on time? Um, you gotta wrap up. You have Minutes. Okay, perfect. This is quick. Um, so I just wanted to also touch quickly on immunotherapy because for good reasons, people are very excited about um, the ability to harness the immune system for cancer therapy. So what is immunotherapy in cancer? So essentially, it's using the patient's own immune system to fight cancer. Our immune system is good at fighting things that are foreign, that keeps away bacteria and viruses and so forth, and so it also potentially can be harnessed to to um, uh, uh, attack cancer. And there's different ways to do it. There are, I think, uh, there are what we call non-specific immunotherapies, which more generally boost the immune response. So most of the drugs that are out there now, such as the PD-1 inhibitors, such as like <laughs> Keytruda and other checkpoint drugs are in this category. They're not a vaccine. They're not particularly going after the tumor. They're more trying to sort of generally activate the immune system. The other general approach are the more uh, targeted ones um, to trying to elicit a pro-tumor response, such as the tumor vaccines or other things, such as CAR T cells that, that, that people are <coughs> developing. And the ones that are most, um, so far, the most uh, furtherly uh, the most uh, furthest developed in gastric cancer is clearly the <coughs> checkpoint inhibitors. And this, what a checkpoint is, is basically the immune system has ways to turn itself on, turn itself off, and there are certain tools that the immune system has to re reduce its activity. So, you know, if you get um, um, a, a cold, you know, you want your immune system to fight the virus, but at some point you want your immune system to turn itself off. You don't want to go into, you know, uh, anaphylactic shock. It has to sort of balance itself. 
And so there are tools that the immune system has to turn itself off. And one of these tools is a protein called PD-1. And sometimes cancers take advantage of this because cancers then try to activate things that turn off the immune system, such as turning on proteins like PD-L1, PD-L2, which can turn on PD-1 and basically put the brakes on the immune system. And so what we're finding is sometimes taking, taking the brakes off can allow the immune system to become more active. And we're already seeing that this can have efficacy in gastric cancer. And so this is, I think, a little bit older data. This is from uh, a year and a half ago, but you know, there, some of the PD-1 agents are now showing efficacy in gastric cancer. Um, now, these therapies can work, but so far they only work in some patients. The response rates have been in the you know, low teens to mid-20s for these different inhibitors so far. And we don't know a lot right now about how these, or sorry, which patients are generally going to benefit from these drugs. And we also don't have as good a sense about when these drugs stop working, why that is. And so just like it's early days for developing sort of genome-guided targeted therapy, it's probably even earlier days for figuring out how to use these uh, kinds of inhibitors in stomach and other cancers. Um, so, but immunotherapy is exciting and for a good reason. Uh, but right now we don't, at least I think that's right, of this time have clearly um, FDA um, approved agents in gastric cancer quite yet. I think the new uh, trials are emerging. I think the ones with uh, the Merck PD-1 inhibitor are probably the furthest along, but the uh, uh, PD-1 inhibitor from bristol myers Squibb um, has also shown some efficacy as in data recently <laughs> presented. But we still have to learn lots of rules here about the markers to tell us who's going to respond, who's less likely, how the, ther how the drugs will, um, or how the tumors will develop resistance, and how to <clears throat> combine these drugs with other therapies. So there's still a lot of work <clears throat> to be done here, but this is a very exciting and <clears throat> promising uh, area. So I forget that's my last, yes. So that's, that's what I wanted to show, share is a little bit about how we're trying to increasingly use our knowledge of <clears throat> biology to develop better cancer therapies. You know, again, I think when we compare where we're gonna be in 20 years to now, these therapies are gonna be instrumental until how we're gonna make things better, but there's really a lot to do in the meantime, and that requires a lot of work and a lot of research. And so to, one more plug for <laughs> Debbie, and one um, clear deficit in this field has been that there's been much less uh, focused research in many areas of cancer, so I think the advocacy from Debbie and colleagues is definitely helping a lot. Um, but um, so thank you all for your time. Happy to answer any questions. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Bass. Um, thank you so much for taking a topic like genomics, a difficult topic, and really simplifying it for us to understand, as well as the great excitement that's going on right now in immunotherapies and giving us kind of a, a primer to before mm. Dr. Ilson will talk about the clinical trials that are going on in general with all compounds, including immunotherapies. So right now I'd like to open up to a, a couple of questions because we're a little behind time um, for Dr. Bass. Um, questions? Okay. No questions. Wow, we're now on time. <laughs> no, there's oh. one question in the back. Okay. okay. From one of the scientists. Okay. Yes. So my question is regarding the um, patient-derived xenograft models. Um, so you're saying that would be a really good tool to look at combination therapies or therapies that you treat the patient with, but then you, they may, um, the tumor may change and mm -hmm. you might need to treat with a, a different um, therapy. Yeah. So one of the um, downfalls to that patient, uh, the PDX models, is that they are typically used in immunocompromised mice, so mice that do not mm -hmm. have an existing immune system. So do you think, or I'm not exactly familiar with much of the, the research that's being done with those models, but is the immune system is plays a big role in cancer. and so. Are these models um, that are very expensive to create, are they showing good results? Or are they showing um, therapies that will actually work in patients? I think that's an excellent question. I think just to sort of um, to 
to, to, to sort of uh, uh, bring it down to a more lay, lay level, I'll say that, so when you, when you take a cancer, sample, cancer from a patient and then you want to grow it into a mouse, if you put a piece of human tumor into a regular mouse, the mouse's the, the immune system would just a, attack the tumor. So the mice we use in the laboratory, we have different types of mice, which are basically have different degrees of immunodeficiency to basically to block these immune system's ability to attack the tumor. And so, um, and so I think what that means is that those mice are useful for certain questions, such as, you know, uh, if you want to give a inhibitor to the, you know, the HER2 protein and HER2 amplified tumors and to see how the cell wiring switches to work around um, HER2, it could be quite effective for that. I think the question is if you wanted to think about how to combine HER2 therapy and immunotherapy, then um, a immunocompromised mouse isn't a good way to study in immune therapy. And so I think for those kinds of questions, I think we do need new generations of models. This is the kind of things I know that we're working on right now to actually, then you actually have to really, in that case, build, you have to use different kind of technologies to build human-like cancer in the mouse. You have to sort of do gene engineering to, you know, take the mouse's stomach cell and put in the gene changes that will make that cell cancerous, because then you would have that, um, that cancer in a mouse, but that mouse would still have an active immune system. There's some other tricks of trying to humanize the mouse, but that's, uh, but, you know, so this is very much an area in progress right now. Um, so I think I think the the what the short answer is the I think the the PDX work we're doing now is I think helping us think more about non-immune therapies, how to combine uh, sort of more gene-based therapies in the cancer cell, um, you know, in, in terms of um, of how to build those co combinations. I think the next generation of mouse models we're trying to build will be the ones that will let us ask the questions about combining immunotherapy. Um, so that's th that 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 that, uh, that caveat is very important, and so the ones we the easier ones with the patient-derived cell lines right now are not good for immune therapies, but the ones that we're trying to build we hope will, will be in the future, and we're sort of pushing ahead very much on building those models right now because we know that um, um, we 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 know that we need them to to sort of try to answer these questions because it's very, a big challenge in the immunotherapy field right now is how to develop combinations. Because in the past, we've done tests and developed combinations by studying cancer cells growing in a plastic dish or growing, studying cancer cells growing in an immunocompromised mouse. So definitely a plastic dish does not have an immune system and a mouse whose immune system is turned off doesn't have an immune system. So it's a big problem in the field as we try to think about how to develop immunotherapies. What are the models to do that? And right now the models aren't very good. And so what's really happening is things are going into trial just a little bit haphazardly without a lot of good rationale as to why to mix this drug and this drug for immunotherapy. And um, it's going to it is a lot of work to be done to build the models to do this that have the active immune system but also are close enough to the real human cancer. We're working on this. It's, it's not a small task, <laughs> mm -hmm. but, um, but we're, we actually have people in the lab right now trying to do it. I don't know if it's Saturday morning, but I don't know if they're still there, but, um, <laughs> but we have people working on it, yeah. Okay. yeah. Question in the back? Yes, uh, once you find out you're HER2 positive, do you always stay HER2 positive? That's a great question. Um, uh, something else we're working on. So, the, um, so, the, so there's a big uh, focus right now in cancer genomics in general, thinking about tumors being heterogeneous. And what I mean by heterogeneous is that things change. So every time a cell <laughs> divides, that cells, the, the, the daughter cells, you know, that, are, that come from that parent cell are going to be a little bit different. You know, that's true of all even are the normal cells in our body. Now, in a cancer cell, that's even more true because cancer cells don't take care of their DNA as carefully. And so what we're increasingly seeing is that there is variation in the spectrum of the genome across the tumor. You know, and we're doing some work now where you take a tumor and you look at the right half or the left half or the right half and the left half versus the lymph node versus the 
metastasis, and we are definitely seeing differences. So I am quite um, confident that understanding those differences are going to be an important part of guiding therapy in the future. Then the question is, how do you do that? You know, putting a needle into every single metastasis to do a biopsy and then sequence all the different pieces, um, it's not a terribly easy thing to do. Uh, I think there's some hope, reasonably so, that some emerging technologies such as sequencing the circulating DNA, DNA shed by the tumor that you could get just from a normal blood draw will give us some clues to that in the future. But I think that's a very, very important um, question. And um, I think that's also going to be an important barrier for how sometimes you might think you have the right drug for the right patient, but it doesn't work. Because sometimes you could imagine that HER2 or some gene is turned on in the part of the primary tumor that you did the biopsy from, and then you want to give the, the HER2 or the targeted inhibitor to make the, the tumor in the, the liver shrink. But we're making the assumption that what we see here is the same as there, and that assumption is not always right. And so, um, again, I think that's another caveat of why we have a lot of work to do to understand this and how to build effective therapies.